Hello there. You're very welcome. Good evening. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Live Irish Myths. Tonight we have episode number 229, which is the 13th reading from Charles Squire's book, uh, Celtic Myth and Legend, Poetry and Romance, published in 1912. You're all very welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library. This is Monday evening. It's 8 p.m. Irish time. It's 3 p.m. in New York. It's midday in Seattle and San Francisco. And if you're, no matter where you're watching, if you do comment, we will say hello to you. Great to see so many of you in the library at this time. It is a gorgeous evening here in the Boyne Valley. We had today a, a short period of significant rainfall. The first rainfall we've had in, oh, has to be at least two weeks. We've had a glorious uh, summer. Uh, the sun is shining in directly onto the camera at the moment. And uh, we've been commenting on this over the last few live streams uh, that in midsummer, the sun comes around behind the house far enough to shine its light directly in to the library. I will put the blind down for the moment uh, until uh, the glare of the sun goes away. Not that we're complaining about that too much. I doubt you'll complain very much at the end of the day. Uh, you probably... I uh, don't want to be seeing too much of my ugly smush. As they say in Ireland, smush, another word for face. I will say hello to you all uh, presently. Uh, please do come in, make yourselves comfortable. Find a comfortable place to sit. Hope you have a, uh, a, a nice cup of tea or some sort of a brew or a dram or something stronger. Stronger than a dram, you say? Stop uh, this nonsense, Anthony. Uh, yes, let us quickly say hello to everybody who's here so far. The first person to say hello tonight was Samantha Healy's uh, looking forward to Mythical Ireland time. Yeah, brilliant stuff, Samantha. Great to see you again. You're welcome. Brax is in the house on YouTube. Don't forget, if you're watching on YouTube, do subscribe to the Mythical Ireland channel and ring the bell for notifications so that when we're live streaming or indeed when new videos are uploaded, you will get notified. Great to see you, Brax. You're very welcome to Live Irish Myth. Susan Scott has missed a few because of life. That's perfectly OK. But I'm so pleased to be with you today. Hello to all. We are pleased that you're able to make it, uh, Susan. Uh, you're very, very welcome. Alan Hoskins is saying evening, everybody. Hope, hope all well. All good here anyway, Alan. We have to catch up again. We'll have to catch up again a bit later. Enjoy the show. That's okay, Alan. Uh, yeah, Alan is uh, busy, and that is a very good complaint, by the way. Uh, Alan, we'll catch you on the replay. But here is officially your hello and welcome. Wayne Bird is in the house. Good evening, Anthony. Hope everyone is well, and your family are too. Sunny days and stormy evening here in Brum, UK. I wonder if there are thunderstorms in the UK today. Um, I noticed that earlier, people sharing images of the rainfall radar. It looks to be significant rainfall in parts of the UK and some thunderstorms. We have had a beautiful evening. I've just returned from Douth, hence the reason I'm still wearing my tour guides badge, uh, where I had hosted an evening tour of Douth with a lovely little group of people in gorgeous sunshine. And uh, I think, uh, certainly from the reaction, that they all enjoyed it. Please do remember that I'm hosting regular tours now, Mythical Ireland tours over the summer. Um, keep an eye on the Facebook page and the Instagram page. That's Mythical Ireland on Facebook and Instagram, and also on the website on the tours page, uh, which I will share momentarily. And don't forget, when you're on the website, sign up for the newsletter, uh, sign up for the emails, uh, because I will, will promote future tours there. And an announcement coming shortly, an announcement about an announcement, just sharing that link there uh, the, to the tours page where you can find out about other tours that are taking place. Who else have we got in the house? Uh, so Wayne is in Brum in the UK. I don't know where Brum is. I'm, I'm not familiar with it. But anyway, uh, every day is a learning day, they say. Johnny Wilson is watching from Dallas, Texas. Johnny, tell us what the temperature is there. I'm betting it's in the 80s or the 90s. Um, but I hope the weather is lovely there. Sean Patter is in the house, tuning in from the old Tua of Lunya in South Sligo. Looking forward to another, another great show. Welcome back, Sean. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us here on Live Irish Myths. And Scott Doherty is in the house, giving a warm welcome to any newcomers. Yes, indeed. Everybody is made feel welcome, providing you're not spamming uh, or doing saying something nasty. We have had to ban a few people over the over the, the years, but mostly people are very, very well behaved. Anna L is saying, Trinona, Trinona might. Uh, I know what you meant, Anthony, and all of the two. I hope you're all enjoying the good weather like we do at Costa del Balbrigan. Isn't it wonderful, you know? <laughs> Pardon me, these are the times when you say, if Ireland was like this more often, we'd never have to go abroad to look for the sun. Lily Shambles is reverting to northern and just saying hi, I hope. Uh, 
hope you all well. Hello, Lily, and uh, all good, and I hope you're well too. Rex Fortenbury, Lama uh, a Good day to everybody. Coraman Sauro Hugot o Louisiana, and uh, I presume that's uh, Sauro's summer hugot to you, Coram. Uh, he's wishing us a good summer, I think, from Louisiana. I hope uh, the summer is in nice in Louisiana. I imagine it is beautiful down south. John Main is saying greetings on Tuago Lair from a zesty and sunny Crete, one home of mythology to another. Yes, indeed, John. Hope you're settled in and uh, great to see you. I uh, wonder what time it is there. I can't remember whether you said it's one or two hours ahead late, later at night there. Uh, Leanne Delaney is saying good evening to uh, Hello, Leanne, watching on YouTube. You're very welcome to Live Irish Myths. Chungus Khan is in the house. Woo! Glad to have made it. Gormagut. Well, we're glad you made it, uh, Chungus. And uh, thank you for your uh, lighthearted and sometimes witty commentary in the uh, in the, uh, in the the um the chat, which we enjoy greatly. Kathy Millet is saying hello from Chicago. Kathy, I'm not sure if we've seen you on Live Irish Mits before. If we have, forgive me for saying it's your first time. And um, if it is your first time, you're very, very welcome. Hope you enjoy yourself here. Rowan Grove is in Colorado where it's raining. We just had a serious thunderstorm here. Well, there you go. You see, it's not all sunbeams and nice, warm, uh, dry weather. Grace Walker is saying hi, hi. Hello, Grace. Good evening. Also watching on YouTube. Um... Do I need to clean my lugs out, or are you talking through a towel? Is the sound okay? Um, oh, maybe people would let me know if the sound quality is okay. Um, Lily seems to think that it isn't. Brendan Byrne is watching from a hot and muggy Glendalough. Yes, it got warmer and muggier over the last couple of days. It can be quite uncomfortable at times. Remind, reminds us how dry it has been. Um and it's been very nice. Carmel O'Dwyer is also watching on YouTube. Good to see you. Hello, Carmel. Also good to see you. Falcha, good G on Laurel and Shook. Anne McCallum's in the house. Hello, Anthony and the Mighty Two. I hope everyone's in great form. Finally got the much needed rain yesterday. Yes, we got it today after a long dry spell. Hopefully the change in the weather and the winds will help with the devastating wildfires and the poor air quality. Yes, indeed. Fingers crossed. Looking forward to another wonderful episode. Slaunch, Anthony. Thank you indeed, Anne. And for your communication by email, which was much appreciated. Uh, yup, says uh, Lily. Uh, rain and mini storm here in middle England tonight. But prior to that, shush, don't tell anyone. We had so much sun. <laughs> Spread it around. Thunderstorms, thunderstorms even also forecasted for uh, Crete in the Mediterranean, where John Main is. Samantha Healy is saying Brum is Birmingham, I think. Oh, there you go. You see, I told you every day is a learning day. I learn something new every day. Tom King has joined us. Hello, Anthony and the Mighty Two. A lovely day in the Boyne Valley. Look forward to story time. Enjoy. Yes, indeed. And whatever you're working on in the background, Tom, uh, I have no doubt it'll be wonderfully beautiful. 86 Fahrenheit in Dallas. Wow. Let us quickly do the conversions for the European audience. Uh, that is 30 Celsius. Wow. Nice. Brum. Short for Birmingham, says Wayne. Do you know what? I didn't know that. Lynn Foley is in El Paso, in Texas. A toasty 87 Fahrenheit slash 31 Celsius. Oh, 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 nice. Very nice. Who am I missing? Lovely to see all the chat that's going on. It's brilliant. Uh, Arvon Gaunt is in the house watching on YouTube. Hello, Arvon. Good evening to you. Thank you for joining us here for episode number 229. John Main says sound is sound here. Sounds good. <laughs> Before I disappear for now, Brum equals Birmingham. Well, Alan, hopefully you can join us later. And of course, don't forget, as always, you can watch the rerun. Sound is not as clear, says Martina. Mm, interesting. I wonder, are there processes running in the background? Uh, anything that's running that's maybe causing... Sometimes that's just caused by uh, bandwidth. I'm going to shut down a couple of things here just to see if the load on the computer can be reduced somewhat. Let me shut that down and that and that and that. Hopefully that will make a difference. Cy B says, yes, muggy, and I have my... Lipoma back up in the morning. St. John's Hospital Limerick. Well, the best of luck for that site. Hope that goes well. Hope that's not too much of an inconvenience for you. The best wishes from us, from myself and all the Tua. Irish technical thinker who's Marcus based in Belfast is saying Dia, uh, Gia Tua more. Uh, and the same right back at you. Gordon Farrell is watching from Longford. Good evening, Gordon. Always a pleasure. You sound good here, says Susan. Well, that's, do you know what? Brilliant. Thumbs up. Arch Astronomy Database, I've missed a few catching this one on the go. Arch Astronomy Database reminding me that I never got to make that observation because there were cattle in the field. 
Uh, you're just reminding me now that I got an email from you and I never replied to it. Um, I've been hectic, but you may have seen from last week's episode that I've uh, decided to quit my day job to concentrate uh, full time on Mythical Ireland. Um, so I'm hoping to get more time to do other things. Uh, good evening all, says Mavanway Millward, hot and humid in Bristol with thunder on and off, giving us a bit of drama. It's probably not that hot compared to others. Yeah, I'm looking actually at the, the Irish um, rainfall radar and I'm seeing a huge big clump of uh, rain through the middle of Wales at the moment. Can't see just as far as England, uh, Bristol, of course, uh, just south of Wales there on the other side of the channel. Um Sounds much better, says Martina. Hopefully that has made the difference. Great to catch you today. Couldn't get connected last week, so missed last week's episode and the big announcements, but thankfully caught up later. Brilliant stuff, Anne. And of course, you always do that. You're a very loyal, a very, very loyal follower. One of the regular regulars. Oh, and Roy Badziak is in the house. Uh, waiting for another thunderstorm in Berkshire. Wow. Come here, listen. Will you do me a favor, all you uh, across the water in Britain there? Will you just keep all the thunderstorms over there and stop them coming across the Irish Sea? Would be wonderful. <laughs> uh, well congratulations says Mavanway on leaving the day job well yes it's a little bit nerve wracking but at the same time I've just decided I need to concentrate there are big things happening and uh, lots going on behind the scenes and I just was working seven days a week and it was getting to the stage where I actually wasn't able to physically wasn't able to answer correspondence and messages because I was just exhausted and too busy and on the positive side I've, I've gotten out and about doing loads of tours uh, feeling better I kind of think I got a bit lazy in the winter and was eating a lot so I've lost a bit of weight I've got a bit of color on my f skin and um, yeah I uh, feel like I'm I'm kind of a little bit fitter and happier in myself Astro says hello all well hello and what a, a wonderfully beautiful uh, handle you have anything relating to the stars I am fascinated by um, so what time are we on uh 17 minutes already no way no okay that's 17 minutes including the five minute introductory video uh the eclipse thing that countdown counts down to the beginning uh guess just me then off to stick a hose in one ear and watch it <laughs> yeah uh hopefully uh that will resolve itself lily because it's not ideal to have some sort of muffled sound erica is joining us from Ip ipswich in the uk a very good evening to you falja erica and i can guess that there's been showers there it seems to be a theme uh, across the way barbara murphy is watching from a warm and sunny tucson in arizona well we're glad that the weather is good over there rowan says more thunder coming along here and a friend just pinged that the neighbor's house was struck and is on fire i hope they're okay goodness me wow uh yeah let's uh send our best wishes in that direction the coloradoans are experience something experiencing something of a thunderstorm at the moment um I would love to be able to tell you uh, the news that is uh, on the tip of my tongue uh, and which will be announced officially in a matter of hours, either later tonight or early tomorrow. Um, I think I mentioned it last week. Um, and just to mention that there is a new Mythical Ireland initiative in conjunction with somebody else uh, to provide tours uh, in a uh, let us just say uh, uh, without giving it away a mythological and archaeological landscape uh, where it hasn't been possible to do these tours before and to hear about and get up close with some of the monuments and some of the mythology of this particular landscape um, those will be held once a week during the summer um, and uh, will include an extra special element can't say too much until I'm officially announcing it, but I will announce it on the website, on the blog, and on the social media at the earliest opportunity. That will hopefully be, hopefully, fingers crossed, all going well uh, within a matter of hours. By this time tomorrow, hopefully, it will be, um, uh, shall we say, uh, public knowledge. Um, and everybody will know, just reminded that I missed... I missed a communication while I was at Douth. Uh, anyway, never mind. I'm getting distracted. A polymathing says, uh, a hoyo from a very rainy Aurora, Canada. Well, I suppose that's good news because as Anne and others have been saying, maybe a bit of rain in Canada will help to douse those fires that seem to be causing uh, a lot of uh, problems. 
Um, my train was hit by a tree that has been knocked into that had been knocked by in a vicious thunderstorm, monsoon, rain, and hail. Wow, some extreme weather going on around the place. Helena Breen has joined us. Hello, Helena. Welcome to Live Irish Mits. Always a pleasure. It's it is a melancholically beautiful rainy day here in Ontario, says Arvon. There you go, melancholically. Wow, nice word. We we're waiting with bated breath, says Mavanway. Um, could you could maybe hint a tad more at the end of the show, please? Says Lily. Ah, uh, yeah, I probably could. To be honest, I could probably announce it. Um, uh, don't think I'd upset anybody too much if I announce it, but I just want to make sure that uh, the announcement press release uh, goes out, um, so that everybody's given a chance to. Anyway, I'm excited about it, and and you know, just maybe not so many of you will be excited about it, but I'm hoping certainly to see some of you on this very special tour over the summer. Um, part of the reason why it's kind of got to the stage where I had to leave the job because otherwise I wouldn't be able to do these initiatives. And this is what I love doing, you know, talking about the things I love talking about. Follow your bliss, it says on the front of my notebook. Look at this notebook that I've been using for a while. This is a Joseph Campbell quote that many of you will be familiar with. Follow your bliss and the universe will open doors where there are only walls. Well, I'm certainly following my bliss, folks, and some doors have opened very magically. So I'll keep you posted. Love a surprise, says Lynn Foley. Well, so do I, especially a pleasant one. Uh, thank you, Alwyn, on the congratulations. Yes, a big move, but uh, onwards and upwards, as they say. Happy Monday night from Balia Brigine, says Peter Kennedy. Peter, what a joy to see you again, as always. Uh, somebody else, Anna L, saying she's uh, reporting in from Costa del Balbrigan. Uh, Adina Sparks is in the house, coming in a bit late. Sad, sadly, we had a chicken massacre that I had to take care of. Did the fox? Was it a fox? Uh, follow your bliss, says Martina. Best of luck. Thank you very much for that. Da hero's journey, says Polly Mathing. Well, yes, yeah, exactly. Do 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 do. Twilight Zone, says Helena. <laughs> or a coyote, uh, Barbara is asking. Not necessarily a fox, maybe a coyote. Love how you left the publicity bus just before you needed publicity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's gotten to the stage where there is such a wonderfully diverse and vast following uh, for Mythical Ireland Online um, that, you know, th thankfully where I have hosted, for instance, the Fornox tours that I held in the past week, uh, five of them were all sold out and all sold out very quickly. And um, so I'll be hosting more of those at the earliest opportunity. There are two tickets left for Myth and Metal. Myth and Metal is a day of fun. That myself and Tom King are planning at his forge. And there are only two tickets left for the 25th, which is Sunday, the 25th of June. That's a 10 a.m. start and a 5 p.m. finish. Basically, stories, forging, a visit to the famine house and a feast. And it'll be great crack. I can promise you that, you know. So I'm just again sharing the tours page just in case you're interested in that. Get one or two of the very last tickets for that. We do hope to repeat that event in the near future. Uh, this, I suppose, uh, is the first one. So um, we're hoping to repeat it maybe once a month, maybe even more regularly. Who knows if the if the demand is there. Sotanar is in the house. Fault you, uh, Sotanar. Conestot. Tommy Gama. August Tusa Fain. Uh, August Two Fain. Grace Walker is in New York. Hope you're all doing well and many blessings. Thank you, Grace. Doing fine. And uh, right back at you there on the East Coast. Um, amen, says Irish technical thinker. Yes, follow your bliss and all of that uh, so i shall proceed with tonight's so we were over the last three episodes we were reading the irish iliad what happened after the the arrival of the malaysians and the the two of the Danon going into the sheep we are now starting a chapter called some gaelic love stories <laughs> pardon me oh anthony don't start that 17 pages too much for one episode but I could easily read nine pages tonight, I reckon. So we'll see how it goes. Is everybody settled and comfortable and ready for story time? No problem, Grace. And uh, pred predictive text, yes, can change all sorts of words. Uh, it's, it can be very funny. The, the inventor of, uh, uh, what is it called? Not predictive text. What is it called? This Not spell checker. Uh... I'm having a brain fart here. I was going to tell you a joke. Um, give me a second. 
in yes, the man who invented autocorrect has died. May he roast in piss. <laughs> Adrian Beglin, uh, Adrian O'Beglin, you are very, very welcome. Autocorrect, Sotinar. Yes, exactly. The brain, as I always say, there's something, the wheels are, are in motion, but it can't get the information from there to here quick enough, you know? Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Rowan would dearly love to attend the Myth and Metal event, but the commute is a bit far, yes. Uh, no direct flights from uh, Colorado to... Uh, Bohermeen, but you know that's something for the airlines to work on you know, anyway we shall begin, this is called Some Gaelic Love Stories it's chapter 13 of a Squire's, uh, Charles Squire's uh, uh, Celtic Myth and Legend Poetry and Romance, this is a uh, more modern reprint of the same, published in 1998 by Senate Books, simply called Mythology of the Celtic People okay, let us uh, we should get going, it's 22 minutes was worth the struggle, says Polly Mathing. I hope so. And a few people uh, laughing. I'm quite a good response to that one, actually, as as my uh, dad jokes goes. That was possibly a better one. Caption, says Barbara. No, not quite, but you know what I was getting at. The heroic age of Ireland was not, however, the mere orgy of battle, which one might assume from the previous chapter. Good on that. It had room for its Helen and its Andromache, as well as for its Achilles and its Hector. Its champions could find time to make love as well as war. More than this, the legends of their courtships often have a romantic beauty found in no other early literature. The women have free scope of choice and claim the respect of their wooers. Indeed, it has been pointed out, not all, in, uh, yes, well, this is later maybe, not all. Don't forget in Tuckmark Etain, um, uh, Angus paid uh, uh, the Ulster King, uh, her father, uh, her weight in gold and silver to buy her. There you go. Indeed, it has been pointed out that the mythical stories of the Celts must have created the chivalrous romances of medieval Europe. In them and in no other previous literature do we find such knightly treatment of an enemy as we see in the story of Cuchulain and Ferdia or such poetic delicacy towards a woman as is displayed in the wooing of Emer, Tuchmark Emera. And there's a footnote here. The romance of the wooing of Emer, a fragment of which is contained in the book of the Dun Cow, Laurenahira, has been translated by Dr. Kuno Meyer and published by him in the Archaeological Review, Volume 1, 1888. Miss Hull, I think it was her name, Eleanor Hull, was included sorry, has included this translation in her Cuchulain saga. Another version of it, from a Bodleian manuscript, translated by the same scholar, will be found in Revu Celtique, volume 11, XI. The talk between man and maid when Cuchulain comes in his chariot to pay his suit to Emer at Forgall's Dune might, save for its strangeness, almost have come out of some quite modern romance. Emer lifted up her lovely face and recognised Cuchulain, and she said, May God make smooth the path before you. Uh, Irish technical thinker points out that today it's called stalking. Yeah. And you, he said, may you be safe from every harm. What a way! To, I mean, can you imagine a modern couple in a disco, you know? And, uh, the lady, the lady's first words to the man are not, you come here often. What's your name? Where are you from? Our first words are, may God make smooth the path before you. And he responds with the boom, boom, boom of the music going behind, downing his vodka. And you, may you be safe from every harm. Wow. Chivalrous romance. You know what I mean? There's nothing like it. She asks him whence he has come and he tells her. Then he questions her about herself. I am a Tara of women, she replies, the whitest of maidens, one who is gazed at, but who gazes not back. A rush too far to be reached, an untrodden way. I was brought up in ancient virtues, in lawful behaviour, in the keeping of chastity, in rank equal to a queen, in stateliness of form, 
so that to me is attributed every noble grace among the hosts of Aaron's women. Adele, Perth has joined us. Good morning to you, Adele. Just goes in with, yeah, I know. Can you imagine it? Yes, good morning to you, Adele. Thank you for joining us. Excuse me, Anthony, modern disco. Yeah, discos are modern, aren't they? It's like a stupid thing for me to say. Yes, I guess. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Rowan is like, discos still exist. Uh, apologies. Y y yes, uh, uh, yes, brain fart again. Forgive me for my momentary lapses. Sometimes the words come out um, without me actually doing any thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you for drawing attention to the fact that not everything I say makes 100% sense. Kibble Henge has joined us. Hello there to you. Uh, greetings from Drone Henge uh, in, here in the Boyne Valley. In more boastful strain, Cuchulain tells of his own birth and deeds. Not like the son of a peasant had he been reared at Concovar's court, but among heroes and champions jesters and druids when he is weakest his strength is that of 20 alone he will fight against 40 a hundred men would feel safe under his protection one can imagine emer's smile as she listens to these braggings truly she says they are goodly feats for a tender boy but they are not yet those of chariot chiefs very modern too, is the way in which she coyly reminds her wooer that she has an elder sister as yet unwed. But when at last he drives her to the point, she answers him with gentle but proud decision. Not by words, but by deeds is she to be won. The man she will marry must have his name mentioned wherever the exploits are of heroes are spoken of. Even as you have commanded, so shall all by me be done, said Cuchulain. Wow, imagine a bloke saying to a girl in a disco, you know, your wish will be my command. And by me your offer is accepted, it is taken, it is granted, replied Emer. Well, they're off to a good start here, folks. I just would encourage them to sign a prenup just in case. It seems a pity that after so fine a wooing, Cucullan could not have kept faithful to the, to the bride he won. See what I mean? <sighs> Yet such is not the way of heroes whom goddesses as well as mortal women conspire to tempt from their loyalty. Fond, the wife of Mananon, son of Lear, deserted by the sea god. Fand, if you prefer. Fand or fond sent her sister Liban, uh, that would be Levon, V because of the Lenishan, Levon to Cuchulain as an ambassador of love. At first he refused to visit her, but ordered Leg, his charioteer, to go with Levon to the happy plain to spy out the land. Leg re returned enraptured. If all Ireland were mine, he assured his master, with supreme rule over its fair inhabitants, I would give it up without regret to go and live in the place that I have seen. And of course, when he talks about the Happy Plain, that is one of these Irish Elysiums, one of the afterlifes or the, uh, the other worlds, you know. Teresa Collins is in the house. Hello, Teresa. How good of you to join us watching on YouTube. Ternonua Makarja. Mokhara even. Uh, so Cuchulain himself went and stayed a month in the Celtic paradise with Fa Fand, Fand, the fairest woman of the she. Returning to the land of mortals, he made a tryst with the goddess to meet him again in his own country by the yew tree at the head of Balia Strand. But Emer came to hear of it. Mm -mm -mm, I think this spells trouble, folks and went to the meeting place herself with 50 of her maidens, each armed with a knife to kill her rival. There she found Cuchulain, Laig and Fand. What has led you, Cuchulain, said Emer, to shame me before the women of Erin and all honourable people? I came under your shelter, trusting in your faithfulness, and now you seek a cause of quarrel with me. But Cuchulain, hero-like, could not understand why his wife should not be content to take her turn with this other woman. 
surely no unworthy rival, for she was beautiful and came of the lofty race of gods. We see Emer yield at last with queenly pathos, or pathos. Pathos is how you'd pronounce that, isn't it? Yes. Pathos. Pathos. Definitely pathos. Uh, I'm, I am not, definitely not, checking Google for the pronunciation of pathos. Not. Definitely not. You didn't hear that. A quality that evokes pity or sadness. I will not refuse this woman to you if you long for her, she said. For I know that everything that is new seems fair, and everything that is common seems bitter. And everything, <laughs> in other words, familiarity breeds contempt. And everything we have not seems desirable to us, and everything we have we think little of. And yet, Cuchulain, I was once pleasing to you, and I would wish to be so again. Her grief touched him. By my word, he said, you are pleasing to me and will be as long as I live. Then let me be given up, said Fand. It is better that I should be, replied Emer. No, said Fand, it is I who must be given up in the end. These are basically two women pleading with the young warrior to let them go and let the other take the place. Interesting. You don't see that in modern life, folks, too much. It is I who will go, though I go with great sorrow. I would rather stay with Cuchulain than live in the sunny home of the gods. O oh, Emer, he is yours. You are worthy of him. What my hand cannot have, my heart may yet wish well to. A sorrowful thing it is to love without return. Better to renounce than not to receive a love equal to one's own. It was not well of you, O oh, fair-haired Emer, to come to kill Fand in her misery. It was while the goddess and the human woman were contending with each other in self-sacrifice that Mananon, son of the sea, heard of Fan's trouble and was sorry that he had forsaken her. So he came, invisible to all but her alone. He asked her pardon and she herself could not forget that she had once been happy with the horseman of the crested waves and still might be happy with him again. The god asked her to make her choice between them and when she went to him he shook his mantle between her and Cuchulain. It was one of the magic properties of Mananon's mantle that those between whom it was shaken could never meet again. Then Fand returned with her divine husband to the country of the immortals, and the druids of Awanmacha gave Cuchulain and Emer each a drink of oblivion, so that Cuchulain forgot his love and Emer forgot her jealousy. There's a footnote here. This story, known as the sickbed of Cuchulain, translated into French by M. Darbois de Jubainville, will be found in his, uh, can't read it, L'Epopée Celtique en Irlande, the fifth volume of Cours de Littérature Celtique. I hope my French is up to your standards, especially my pronunciation, and that it doesn't sound too much like Inspector Clouseau. Another translation into English by Eugene O'Curry is in Atlantis volumes one and two. The scene of this story takes its name from another and hardly less beautiful love tale. The yew tree at the head of Balia Strand had grown out of the grave of Balia of the Honeyed Speech, and it bore the appearance of Balia's love, Alien. This Gaelic Romeo and Juliet were of royal birth. Balia was heir to Ulster, and Alien was daughter of the King of Leinster's son. Not by any feud of Montague and Capulet were they parted, however, but by the craft of a ghostly enemy. They had appointed to meet one another at Dundalgan, and Balia, who arrived there first, was greeted by a stranger. What news do you bring? asked Balia. None, replied the stranger, except that Alian of Leinster was setting out to meet her lover, but the men of Leinster kept her back, and her heart broke then and there from grief. Cathy May Deo has joined her on a lunch break in sunny Newcastle, Washington State. Hope all are doing well. Always excited about Mondays. What a joy it is to see you. Uh, Cathy May, hope you enjoy your breaks. Spike Willow is in the house. 
Uh, hello there, Spike. Um, yes, uh, Rowan Grove pointing out a, a small but very important detail. Plus, Fand already had a husband. Yes. Yeah, polymathic. Satanta trying to swing the many wives like his papa. <laughs> yeah, yes, 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 yes. Um, any, am I missing anyone else that has joined? I don't think so. If I have, please forgive me. Do say hello, and I will say hello back. When Balya heard this, his own heart broke, and he fell dead on the strand. While the messenger went on, went on the wings of the wind to the home of Alien, who had not yet started. Whence come you? She asked him. From Ulster, by the shore of Dundalgan, where I saw men raising a stone over one who had just died. And, pardon me, oh, I'm sorry for that. I know that's catching. Uh, and on the stone, I read the name of Balya. He had come to meet some woman he was in love with, but it was destined that they should never see one another again in life. At this news, Alien too fell dead and was buried. And we are told that an apple tree grew out of her grave, the apples of which bore the likeness of the face of Balya, while a yew tree sprung from Balya's grave and took the appearance of Alien. How wonderful is that? You know, sorry, I'm taking a margin note here. When have I been known to do that? I always have the pencil on hand. And that reminds me a little bit of the, the Deirdre story of the Sons of Ishna, Ishna where um, uh, they were buried in graves and the trees met above them, which is apparently related, related to the twining branches of the Milky Way. This legend, which is probably a, a part of the common heritage of the Aryans, and as I said, as always with uh, Squire, where you see the word Aryans, we're thinking about Indo-Europeans, is found in folklore over an area which stretches from Ireland to India. Wow, the extremities of the uh, uh, um, Indo-European uh, language area. Ali is in the house watching from Tucson. I hope it's a pleasant afternoon there. A good evening from the Boyne Valley. Where the sun is shining. Well, actually it was. It's gone down behind the roofs now, so I suppose I could uh, leave the blind open now. The Gaelic version, however, has an ending unknown to the others. The two trees it relates were cut down and made into wands, upon which the poets of Ulster and Leinster cut the songs of the love tragedies of their two provinces in Ome, which is a, an early medieval form of writing, uh, mostly Latin-based, and actually... Um, Got a lovely gift from um, a lovely gift from our own Elaine Dent Lingenfelter. Thank you, Elaine, for the beautiful gift, which is a guide to Ohm, uh, and that is by Damien McManus. So I look forward to reading that. I was only asked during the past week at one of my tours at Fornox, uh, did I know much about Ohm? And I had to confess that I don't. Um, that uh, I didn't know a huge amount about it. So I have a scholarly work about Ohm, which I can now read. Thanks to Elaine. Brilliant stuff. Desiree Riley is sneaking in late. You're very welcome, Desiree. Always a pleasure. And uh, it's Coda's birthday today, actually. Coda, can you believe Coda is four today? 12th of, July, 12th of June, should I say. He's four today. Wow. Aryan just means noble and nothing more, says Helena. Yeah, but uh, we were explaining early on in the book that he, he, Squire has a specific meaning for it, which is in, in Indo-European, yet yeah, not to be confused with anything relating to white supremacy or anything like that. Yes, exactly. Rowan says Matt McManus is a very good source on own. Oh, brilliant stuff. That is good to know. Uh, you two could listen to you two by you two. Ah, uh, yes, nice pun there, Polly Mathing. Yeah, <laughs> like triple, triplicate pun, actually. Brilliant stuff. Um, but even these mute memorials of Balia and Alien uh, were destined not to be divided. After 200 years, Art, the lonely high king of Ireland, ordered them to be brought to the hill of Tara and. As soon as the wands found themselves under the same roof, they all sprang together and no force or skill could part them again. So the king commanded them to be kept like any other jewel in the treasury of Tara. That's amazing, isn't it? And that's uh, the full story can be read in volume 13 of Revue Celtique. 
uh, which I will try to read at some point because that's really interesting. Wow, that is really beautiful. I, I love that. So uh, when Balya died, a tree, a yew tree grew over his grave that uh, looked like Alian. And when Alian died, an apple tree grew and it resembled the face of Balya. And later, the poets used wood from the trees, uh, the poets of Ulster and Leinster, uh, and cut the songs of the love tragedies of their two provinces in Oam on those wands. And when Art, the lonely high king of Tara, later ordered them to be brought to Tara, the wands sprang together uh, such that no force could part them again. Fantastic stuff. Brilliant. Love that story. I'd say a uh, Sotinar, it's a bit pre medieval Antony. Officially, uh, they say it goes back to around 100 BC to 400 AD, somewhere, although some say there's evidence of going back further. Okay. Uh, as I say, not an expert on Ohm, uh, and uh, do hope to get stuck into that book uh, fairly soon. So, hopefully, actually, it's something we could do an episode on in the near future, isn't it? Neither of these stories, however, has yet, as yet, has as yet attained the fame of the one now to be retold. To many, no doubt, Gaelic romance is summed up in the one word, Deirdre. It is the legend of this Gaelic Helen that the poets of the modern Celtic school most love to celebrate, while old men still tell it round the peat fires of Ireland and the Highlands. Scholar and peasant alike combine to preserve a tradition no one knows how many hundreds of years old, for it was written down in the 12th century Book of Leinster as one of the prime stories which every bard was bound to be able to recite. It takes rank with the fate of the sons of Turin and with the fate of the children of Lear as one of the three sorrowful stories of Aaron. So favourite a tale has naturally been much altered and added to in its passage down the generations, but its essential story is as follows. King Concovar or Conor MacNessa of Ulster was holding festival in the house of one of his bards called Phelimid. Phelimid. Uh, uh, when Phelimid's wife gave birth to a daughter concerning whom Cothad the Druid uttered a prophecy. He foretold that the newborn child would grow up to be one of the most lovely women, to be, sorry, to be the most lovely woman the world had ever seen, but that her beauty would bring death to many heroes and much peril and sorrow to Ulster. On hearing this, the Red Branch warriors demanded that she should be killed. Wow. But Concovar refused, thank you, Connor and gave the infant to a trusted serving woman to be hidden in a secret place in the solitude of the mountains until she was an, of an age to be his own wife. Not so good, Concovar. That's a little bit creepy. But anyway, let's read on. So Deirdre, as Cofad named her, was taken away to a hut so remote from the paths of men that none knew it save Concovar. Here she was brought up by a nurse, a fosterer, and a teacher, and saw no other living creatures save the beasts and birds of the hills. Nevertheless, woman-like, she aspired to be loved. One day, her foster, her fosterer was killing a calf for their food, and its blood, its blood ran out upon the snowy ground, which brought a black raven swooping to the spot. If there were a man, said Deirdre, who had hair of the blackness of that raven, skin of the whiteness of the snow, and cheeks as red as the calf's blood, that is the man whom I would wish to marry me. Indeed, there is such a man, replied her teacher thoughtlessly. Nisha, one of the sons of Ishnak, heroes of the same race as Concovar the king. The curious Deirdre prevailed upon her teacher to bring Nisha to speak with her. When they met, she made good use of her time, for she offered Nisha her love and begged him to take her away from King Concovar. Nisha, bewitched by her beauty, consented. Accompanied by his two brothers, Arden and Ainle, their fo and their followers, he fled with Deirdre to Alba, where they made alliance with one of his kings and wandered over the land, living, living by following the deer and by helping the king in his battles. Of course, this is Scotland. The revengeful Concovar bided his time, 
One day, as the heroes of the Red Branch feasted together at Awanmaka, he asked them if they had ever heard of a nobler company than their own. They replied that the world could not hold such another. Yet, said the king, we lack our full tale. The three sons of Ishnak would defend, could defend the province of Ulster against any other province of Ireland by themselves. And it is a pity that they should still be exiles for the sake of any woman in the world. Gladly, I would welcome them back. We ourselves, replied the Ultonians, as in the Ulster men, the Ullad, would have counselled this long ago had we dared, O king. Then I will send one of my three best champions to fetch them, said Conquivar. Either Conal the Victorious or Cuchulain the son of Sulcum or Fergus the son of Roy. Fergus MacRoy. And I will find out uh, which of those three loves me best. First he called Conal to him secretly. What would you do, O Conal, he asked, if you were sent to fetch the sons of Ishnak and they were killed here in spite of your safe conduct? There is not a man in Ulster, answered Conal, who, ha who had hand in it that would escape his own death from me. I see that I am not dearest of all men to you, replied Conquivar, and dismissing Conal, he called Cuchulain and put the same question to him. By my sworn word, replied Cuchulain, if such a thing happened with your consent, no bribe or blood fine would I accept in lieu of your own head, O Conquivar. Truly, said the king, it is not you I will send his test in them here, isn't he? Elaine Dent Lingenfelter, speak of, speaking of, and then she suddenly arrives. Where It's in Texas, where it's 33 Celsius. Wow. I've just been saying a, 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 a lovely thank you, uh, Elaine, to you for your wonderful gift of this book about Owen, uh, which I promised to read, uh, and hopefully in the near future. Um, because I was just saying to the folks there, we were talking about a story in which the uh, the love tragedies of uh, Leinster and Ulster were carved onto uh, wood in Oam by uh, the bards. The king then asked Fergus, and he replied that if the sons of Ishnak were slain while under his protection, he would revenge the deed upon anyone who was party to it, save only the king himself. Then it is you who shall go, said Conquivar, after a small amount of arse licking, as we call it in Ireland. Set forth tomorrow and rest not by the way. And when you put foot again in Ireland at the dune of Borach, whatever may happen to you yourself, send the sons of Ishnok forward without delay. The next morning, Fergus with his two sons, Elon the Fair and Bunya the Ruthless Red, set out for Alba in their galley and reached Loch Etiv by whose shores the sons of Ishnak were then living. Nisha, Einle and Arden were sitting at chess when they heard Fergus's shout, no doubt that is Fichil, which is a, a sort of an Irish version. That is the cry of a man of Aaron, said Nisha. Nay, replied Deirdre, who had forebodings of trouble. Do not heed it, it is only the shout of a man of Alba. But the sons of Ishnak knew better and sent Arden down to the seashore where he found Fergus and his sons and gave them greeting and heard their message and brought them back with him. That night, Fergus persuaded the sons of Ishnak to return with him to Awan Macha. Deirdre, with her second sight, implored them to remain in Alba. But the exiles were weary for the sight of their own country and did not share their companions' fears. As they put out to sea, Deirdre uttered her beautiful farewell to Alba, that land she was never to behold again. And here follows a, 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 a poem or a song, probably both. A lovable land is yon eastern land, Alba with its marvels. I would not have come hither out of it had I not come with Nisha. Lovable are Dúin Figa and Dúin Finn, lovable the fortress over them. Dear to the heart, Inish Dreigende, and very dear is Dúin Suvni. Uh, Kyle Cohen, unto whom Einle would wend, alas, Short the time seemed to me with Nisha in the region of Alba. Glen Lodge, often I slept there under the cliff. Fish and venison and the fat of the badger was my portion in Glen Lodge. Glen Ma uh, Mashoin, its garlic was tall, its branches white. We slept a rocking sleep over the grassy estuary of Mashoin. Glen Etive, 
where my first house I raised, beauteous its wood upon rising, a cattle fold for the sun was Glen native. Glen Darua, my love to every man who hath it as an heritage. Sweet the cuckoo's note on bending bough on the peak over Glen Darua. Or Rua. Beloved is Dryan, dear the white sand beneath its waves. I would not have come from it from the east had I not come with my beloved. Yeah, a signed copy, no, nonetheless, Elaine. Even better again. Fantastic stuff. Thank you so much. Really greatly appreciate it. And the Texas T-shirt, which I should wear on one of the live streams, shouldn't I? Um, they crossed the sea and arrived at the Dune of Borach, who bade them welcome to Ireland. Now, King Conquivar had sent Borach a secret command that he should offer a feast to Fergus on his landing. Strange taboos called Gyasa were laid upon the various heroes of ancient Ireland in the stories we have mentioned. These taboos are Gyasa or Gyesh before. There are certain things that each one of them may not do without for forfeiting life or honour, and it was a Gyesh upon Fergus to refuse a feast. Fergus, we are told, reddened with anger from crown to soul at the invitation. Yet he could not avoid the feast. He asked Nisha what he should do, and Deirdre broke in with, do what is asked uh, of you if you prefer to forsake the sons of Ishnak for a feast. Yet forsaking them is a good price to pay for it. Fergus, however, perceived a possible compromise. Though he himself could not refuse to stop to partake of Borak's hospitality, he could send Deirdre and the sons of I Ishnak on to Awanmach or Ushnak, uh, as some people prefer to say it, and maybe closer to the original pronunciation. Uh, and the sons of Ishnak on to Awanmach at once, under the safeguard of his two sons, Ilan the Fair and Bunya the Ruthless Red. So this was done, albeit to the annoyance of the sons of Ishnak and the terror of Deirdre. Visions came to the sorrowful woman. She saw the three sons of Ishnak and Ilan the son of Fergus without their heads. She saw a cloud of blood always hanging over them. She begged them to wait in some safe place until Fergus had finished the feast. But Nisha, Einle and Arden laughed at her fears. They arrived at Awan Macha and Conquivar ordered the Red Branch Palace to be placed at their disposal. In the evening, Conquivar called Leverham, Deirdre's old teacher, to him. Go, he said, to the Red Branch and see Deirdre and bring me back news of her appearance, <coughs> whether she still keeps her former beauty or whether it has left her. So Levercombe came back, sorry, came to the Red Branch and kissed Deirdre and the three sons of Ishnak and warned them that Conquivar was preparing treachery. Then she went back to the king and reported to him that Deirdre's hard life upon the mountains of Alba had ruined her form and face so that she was no longer worthy of his regard lie at this Conquivar's jealousy was partly allayed and he began to doubt whether it would be wise to attack the sons of Ishnak but later on when he had drunk well of wine he sent a second messenger to see if what Leverham had reported about Deirdre was truth the messenger this time a man went and looked in through a window Deirdre saw him and pointed him out to Nisha who flung a chessman at the peering face and put out one of its eyes but the man went back to Conquivar and told him that, though one of his eyes had been struck out, he would gladly have stayed looking with the other. So great was Deirdre's loveliness. Then Conquivar, in his wrath, ordered the men of Ulster to set fire to the Red Branch house and slay all within it except Deirdre. They flung firebrands upon it, but Bunya the Ruthless Red came out and quenched them and drove the assailants back with slaughter. But Conquivar called to him to parley and offered him a hundred of land and his friendship to desert the sons of Ishnak. Bunya was tempted and fell, but the land given him turned barren that very night in indignation at being owned by such a traitor. The other of Fergus's sons was of different make. He charged out, torch in hand, and cut down the Ultonians so that they hesitated to come near the house again. Conquivar dared not offer him a bribe, but he armed his own son, Fiacha, with his own magic weapons, including his shield, the Moner, which roared when its owner was in danger, and sent him to fight Ilum. The duel 
was a fierce one. But, uh, and Ilan got the better of Fieke, so that the son of Concovar had to crouch down beneath his shield, which roared for help. Conal the Victorious heard the roar from far off and thought that his king must be in peril. He came to the place and, without asking questions, thrust his spear blue-green through Ilan. The dying son of Fergus explained the situation to Conal, who, by way of making some amends, at once killed Fierca as well. After this, the sons of Ishnach held their fort until dawn against Con all Concovar's host. But with day, they saw that they must either escape or resign themselves to perish. Putting Deirdre in their centre, protected by their shields, they opened the door suddenly and fled out. They would have broken through and escaped, had not Concovar asked Kafad the Druid to put a spell upon them, promising to spare their lives. So Kafad raised the illusion of a stormy sea before and all round the sons of Ish Ishnak. Nisha lifted Deirdre upon his shoulder, but the magic waves rose higher until they were all obliged to fling away their weapons and swim. Pardon me while I take a bit of a drink. Then was seen the strange sight of men swimming upon dry land. And before the glamour passed away, the sons of Ishnak were seized from behind and brought to Concovar. In spite of his promise to the druid, the king condemned them to death. None of the men of Ulster would, however, deal the blow. In the end, a foreigner from Norway, whose father Nisha had slain, offered to behead them. Each of the brothers begged to die first, that he might not witness the death of the others. But Nisha ended this noble rivalry by lending their executioner the sword called the Retaliator, which had been given him by Mananon son of Lear. They knelt down side by side, and one blow of the sword of the god shore off all their heads. As for Deirdre, there are varying stories of her death, but most of them agree that she did not survive the sons of Ishnak many hours. But before she died, she made an elegy over them, that is, of a singular pa pathos, and beauty, the few verses which there is space to give will show. Long the day without Ushnak's children. It was not mournful to be in their company. Sons of a king by whom sojourners were entertained. Three lions from the hill of the cave. Three darlings of the women of Britain. Three hawks of Schlievgullion. Sons of a king whom valor served, to whom soldiers used to give homage. Homage, if you prefer. Sotonar has gone to feed the dogs. That's perfectly okay. The dogs have to get their water, you know. That I should remain after Nisha, let no one in the world suppose. After Arden and Einle, my time would not be long. Ulster's over-king, my first husband, I forsook for Nisha's love. Short my life after them, I will perform their funeral game. After them, I shall not be alive. Three that would go into every conflict. Three who liked to endure hardships. Three heroes who refused not combats. O oh man! that diggest the tomb and puttest my darling from me. Make not the grave too narrow. I shall be beside the noble ones. Pardon me. It was a poor triumph for Concovar. Deirdre in all her beauty had escaped him by death. His own chief followers never forgave it. Fergus, when he returned from Borach's feast and found out what had been done, gathered his own people, slew Concovar's son and many of his warriors, and fled to Ulster's bitterest enemies, Ailil 
and Maeve of Connacht. And Kafad the Druid cursed both king and kingdom, praying that none of Conquerar's race might ever reign in Awan Macha again. So it came to pass. The capital of Ulster was only kept from ruin by Cuchulain's prowess. When he perished, it also fell and soon became what it is now, a grassy hill. That is Awan Macha, now known as Navan Fort outside the modern city of Armagh. So that is the whole chapter. I managed to read the whole thing, which is great. I am going to read a little bit more, uh, which is something contained in my book, Mythical Ireland, just pertaining to that Twining Branches story, because there is an alternative ending. The alternative ending is uh, that Nisha and Deirdre were, were buried in separate graves. But uh, I won't ruin it. I'll just read it. So give me a second just to find it and take it down off the shelf. And I will be reading from the revised and expanded edition of Mythical Ireland. You may have an earlier version. I'm not sure if there's a huge difference in this chapter between those two editions. But uh, highly recommended that you always get the revised and expanded edition because it is 20,000 words bigger than the original. Uh, just allow me a moment to find it. I think it's in the last section about cosmology. Yeah, 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 it is indeed, it is, it is, it is. Now, uh, so there's a chapter, chapter 7.1 in Mythical Ireland that is called um, the Milky Way in Irish Mythology and Cosmo Cosmogony. Cosmogony is relating to the beginning of the world and the universe. So uh, this is short and sweet, so it won't take long. So the last of the several different names and traditions associated with the Milky Way in Irish uh, myth, folklore and legend is Scriov Clon Ishnach. So bear with me for a moment. Uh, uh, Marianne Kinja is saying uh, hi all a little late. No problem, Marianne. Uh, we're very glad to see you in the house. I'm actually just finishing. But come here. As I always say, um, First of all, no need to apologize. But secondly, as soon as we finish, don't forget on YouTube and on Facebook, the whole episode is uh, available in its entirety. You watch. And I'm very glad to be able to say hello to everybody. Uh, Michael Trotter is uh, saying good morning from New Zealand. Good morning to you, Michael. I hope uh, things are good uh, way down there in the Southern Hemisphere uh, as we approach our midsummer. You're approaching your midwinter. Okay. Scroy of Chlon Ishnak, which literally means the track of the children of Ishnak. Now, there's a footnote. Let me just follow the footnote here. Don't exactly remember why it's track, maybe one of several possible translations of that word. Davidson. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, for 41, 41, 41, 41. That's from Deneen. Gives Scroy as a track, a line, a furrow a mark or a limit mostly by gaelic speaking highlanders who had settled there from the late 18th century through to the middle of the 19th interesting that's i believe should be footnote 42 anyway never mind this last one is contained in a beautiful folk memory recalled in scotland and in nova scotia but relating to an irish myth Deirdre and the Sons of Ishnak, which is one of the three sorrowful tales, the one we've just read a summary of from the Charles Squire book, which appears to be the recounting of an ancient creation myth about the Milky Way. In this story, and we have, don't forget, done an episode pre previously about the Milky Way, especially to those who are more recent uh, viewers of the live stream. Uh, we did, let me just quickly uh, check on the YouTube channel. Uh, the Milky Way in Irish Mythology, episode number 41. So uh, almost 200 episodes ago. In this story, the Milky Way is known as Shkri of Clan Ishnak, the track of the children of Ishnak. In Uist, the Milky Way was known as Shli, Shli Clan Ishna, the way of the Clan Ishna. Now, Shli is an Irish word for a, a way or a road. The, the great Shlí Moor, Shlí Mialocra, those roads, Shlí Ashel, the smooth road uh, where Tom's forge is located, uh, coming 
to and from Torah. Or Shliav Klan Ishna, the declivity of the Klan Ishna. Shliav Klan Ishna, non Korsregiala, is Kuinabius, Baglus Nahala. Translated, declivity of the Klan Ishna, of the white coursers of fairer carriage than a graceful swan. It is not surprising to see the Milky Way described in conjunction with the swan. The constellation we know as Cygnus may have been important to Stone Age astronomers, and it appears to fly along the heavenly river. In the Nova Scotia version of Deirdre and the Sons of Ishnach, quote, the origin of the Milky Way galaxy is depicted as emerging from two trees separated by a loch, as if to complete an arch between them, unquote. This episode is placed in the well-known Ulster tale of Deirdre, whose lover, Nisha, is one of the children of Ishnach. And here is a quote from this alternative version. As I said, this is one of the alternative versions with a different ending than the one we just read. The sons of Ishnach are killed in a great unnamed battle, after which Deirdre falls into the grave with the men. The bodies of the two lovers are exhumed and reburied on either side of the burial mound. Soon, a tree grows from each grave and rises until the two join. This arouses a great deal of vengeful malice in an unnamed king who orders that the trees be cut down. Soon, another pair of trees grows and joins until the king has them cut down as well. This sequence of events recurs repeatedly until the king decides to have their bodies placed on either side of a loch or a lake, a distance too great for the trees to span. Between the trees, a cluster of stars gathers in a light trail, Shkri of Klan Ishnach, track of the children of Ishnach, which is the Milky Way, and depicted in a photograph there that I took at Douth several years ago. And you can see the dark, the dark uh, rift, the lane of dust that runs through the Milky Way that appears to separate the two brighter areas. And this is the idea of the twining branches of uh, the Shkriv clan Ishnak, you know. Uh, Anne McCallum has been reading along. Yeah, isn't it brilliant? Yeah, I hope you're making sure that I'm reading correctly. Yes, of course, says you. I'll be telling you your mistakes. Uh, Tom King is saying hello to Anne. Um, so anyway, yes, don't forget, to, uh, if you would like to support Mythical Ireland now that it is a full-time venture, <laughs> yes, fun and exciting times ahead. Uh, the uh, link to the Patreon page where you can become a patron of Mythical Ireland is there. If you sign up at the Bronze Age level, not only are you getting at the moment, page by page, the draft script of my new book, which I'm working on, but there's a huge amount of historical stuff. So, for instance, I should announce, or I should just reiterate that if you sign up at the Bronze Age patron level, which is $10 a month, uh, you have access to all those uh, things that are still not published publicly, like the conversation with uh, the author Morgan Llewellyn, like the conversation uh, with uh, the full conversation with Michael Slaven, at the uh, author of the Book of Tara and the Ancient Books of Ireland and owner of the old bookshop on the Hill of Tara, and also the long conversation and wonderful conversation I had with um, uh, Michael Quirk, the woodcarver and storyteller in Sligo, and a whole lot of other stuff. So if you join now, you also have access to all the historic. It's not like you just get what's shared from now on. You have everything that was published at that level from now all the way back to when Patreon, Mythical Ireland Patreon began. So something to work out. You know, thank you, Elaine, for your good, uh, your, your, your assured comments and best wishes. Yeah, it is exciting times. And as I say, a big announcement in the next 24 hours. Uh, and as soon as I finish here, Apart from doing a couple of chores, uh, the next thing is to uh, to prepare the material uh, for that, for release, the publicity, pardon me, and the uh, the photography, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I hope you find it interesting. Maybe some of you will go, well, that was the big announcement. Nothing exciting about that. But I'm sure some of you will, in fact, find it exciting. Uh, anything else? Um, yeah, just to mention again that... Uh, the only tour currently on sale on the Mythical Ireland website is the Myth and Metal with myself and Tom King at the Forge on 
Sunday Sunday week on the 25th. Um, that is a day of stories and uh, fun and metal and forging and walking to the famine house and having a feast. And we are um, determined that all the participants will have a ball, have a great time. Hopefully it will be a very memorable day for all the right reasons. Sheila Gunn, thank you for that. Those conversations are amazing. Yeah, and a lot of time and effort it went into them and especially to the, well, to the filming and then the editing. Um, uh, very, want to do more of those and hopefully have the time, will have the time soon to do them when I leave the job. I've given my notice and I'm just serving out my notice. So Elaine wants to be there so badly, but look, if it's a success, we'll run it again uh, and uh, hope, hopefully repeatedly, you know. Uh, so just to remind you, actually, the Douth tour, which was on earlier, is still on the tours page and it is finished now. So I'll remove that or delete it as they say, remove it for now. So the Myth and Metal link is going there. How did it get the name The Smooth Road? That's what Bohor Mean means. The townland in which Tom lives, through which Schliashel, this ancient road, passes. Um, uh, Schliashel, the the smooth road. But then, yeah, is there a story associated with that? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Tom will know the answer. And you know what? I'll have that research so that I'll be able to tell the visitors on the day uh, more about it. Grace Walker says, thank you. I'm not sure if we said hello to you earlier, Grace. Uh, watching on YouTube. Uh, very good evening to you. Hope you all have a fabulous uh morning slash afternoon slash evening slash night no matter where you are in the world we have viewers as far away as australia and new zealand we have viewers in canada and the us east middle and west and in other parts of europe i can't wait put me on the board for the 2024 uh, elaine yes indeed brilliant looking forward to that susan scott is excited to be here you've been working full-time and you work for mythical ireland if there's one thing that's more exciting than following your bliss it's following your bliss full time. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And, and, you know, all of this journey began in 1999. And the Mythical Ireland website began in March of the year 2000, believe it or not. So uh, over 23 years and uh, 24 in the case of doing the research. So it's about time, says the man, says the woman, says all the people watching. Jesus, isn't it about time he, he got on, you know, he got on with it. But look, it's a decision that has been a long time coming. And uh, yeah, look, we'll make the very, very, very best of it. And I will do my best to make it happen. Anyway, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Don't forget to come back this day next week and every Monday evening for Live Irish Mits. On rare occasions, we have to postpone. Sometimes it's postponed till Tuesday or Wednesday. I do generally notify on the social media beforehand. Don't forget also, sign up for the mailing list on the website to be, to be kept informed of looming uh, and future uh, Mythical Ireland. Uh, events i do and i ha have a tendency especially during the summer to do impromptu live streams out and about as uh, some of you seem to really enjoy those so watch out for those too in the meantime all that remains for me to say to one and all is ikawa kolosov slongafol which means good night uh, sound sleep bye for now but come here if it's daytime and you're not intended to go to sleep. And if you're driving or operating machinery or doing something important, definitely don't go to sleep. But when you do, call us off. It's long a fold, which means bye for now. And most importantly, uh, buggy, which means take it easy. And thank you, Adrian. Thank you indeed. And of course, I am delighted to have the best wishes and the support of the wonderful Mythical Ireland community who have been tremendous uh, through all the years of this endeavour. Now reaching... Uh, a new a new uh, junction good night folks from the Boyne Valley hope you have a glorious